Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello and welcome to Horse Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. Today we are going to be talking about the Salem Witch Trials. Witches, man. Witches. I have to admit, other than the basics, I really didn't know many details about the Salem Witch Trials, like how it began, why it began, or how it ended, how it changed history. Um, There's a lot of information (laughs) I did not know about this story. While doing my research, I found a quote that comes from an article written by Tara Isabella Burton for Vox titled, There weren't any witches in Salem in 1693, but there sure are now. I wanted to start the episode with this quote. So this is regarding the Salem witch trials. Quote, Is it a story about the dangers of superstition? About what happens when people let fear take over their lives? About misogyny and men policing women's identities? The different ways in which Salem's residents tell and retell the Salem narrative can tell us as much about 20th and 21st century America as they can about New England in 1693. End quote. I thought that statement was very thought provoking. You know, we've been hearing a lot about learning from our history. um, And that's exactly what that quote is about. And it's spot on because what happened over 300 years ago is so very relevant to today. And I really want to have this discussion with Mindy as we tell the story. So let's begin with a quick overview. The Salem witch trials occurred in colonial Massachusetts in 1692 and 1693. According to different sources, somewhere between 150 and 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft and 20 were executed. Since then, the story of the trials has become synonymous with paranoia and injustice, and it continues to beguile the popular imagination more than 300 years later. So let's start a little before 1692. Witch trials were nothing new to the world in 1692. Uh, Between 1482 and 1782, thousands of people across Europe, most of them women, were accused of witchcraft and subsequently executed. But why were so many innocent people suspected of such a crime? Witches are everywhere. Like I said, witches, man. In fairy tales, fantasy, and satire, they appear time and time again as a versatile synonym for evil and transgression. Early witches were people who practiced witchcraft using magic spells and calling upon spirits for help or to bring about change. Most witches were thought to be pagans doing the devil's work. Many, however, were simply natural healers or so-called wise women whose choice of profession was misunderstood. If I had a nickel, right? (laughs) witch hysteria really took hold in Europe during the mid 1400s when many accused witches confessed often under torture to a variety of wicked behaviors within a century witch hunts were common and most of the accused were executed by being burned at the stake or from death by hanging single women widows and other women on the margins of society so that would include you know like women who could read, women who owned more than one cat, married women without children. Those types of folks were especially targeted. So Sharon, you and I would have been totally fucked. (laughs) Uh, Between the years 1500 and 1660, up to 80,000 suspected witches were put to death in Europe. Around 80% of them were women thought to be in cahoots with the devil and filled with lust. Germany had the highest witchcraft execution rate, while Ireland had the lowest. Anyway, as witch hysteria decreased in Europe, it grew in the New World, which was still reeling from the wars between the French and British, a smallpox epidemic, and the ongoing fear of attacks from neighboring Native American tribes. The tense atmosphere was ripe for finding scapegoats. Massachusetts wasn't actually the first of the 13 colonies to obsess about witches. That honor goes to Windsor, Connecticut, where, in 1647, Alice Young became the first person in America executed for witchcraft. Before Connecticut's final witch trial took place in 1697, 46 people were accused of witchcraft in that state, and 11 were put to death for the crime. 
in Virginia, people were less frantic about witches. In fact, in lower Norfolk County in 1655, a law was passed making it a crime to falsely accuse someone of witchcraft. Liberals. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Left wingers. Um, Still, witchcraft was a concern. About two dozen witch trials, mostly of women, took place in Virginia between 1626 and 1730. None of the accused were executed, though. But the best known witch trials took place in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692. So how did those trials begin? Let's get into it. All right. Well... The Salem Witch Trials began when nine-year-old Elizabeth Paris and 11-year-old Abigail Williams began suffering from fits. They would have fits in which their bodies would appear to involuntarily convulse, their eyes would roll back into their heads, and their mouths would hang open. Sounds kind of like a seizure. Uh, yeah, but, right? <laughs> um, who knows? I'm no, I'm no doctor. <laughs> I'm, I'm no doctor, but it do, does sound like they're having seizures, possibly. Um, as more young women began to exhibit similar symptoms, mass hysteria ensued, resulting in three women being accused of witchcraft. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba, an enslaved woman owned by Paris's father. So let's start with Sarah Good. She was born in 1655, the daughter of a well-to-do tavern owner in Wenham, Massachusetts. Forgive me if I mispronounce all the names of the cities (laughs) that I'm going to read in Massachusetts. I'm sure you pronounce them very differently if you're a local. But I'm going with Wenham or Wenham. Yeah, I think it's probably Wenham. Yeah, you probably just leave out the uh, H. It's a silent H. (laughs) When she was 17 years old, her father committed suicide. His 70-acre estate was valued around 500 pounds, and he didn't leave a will. Spencer, find out how much 500 pounds was back in 1655-ish. All right, I think it's about 30 kilograms. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. Math. Um, The estate was divided mostly between his widow and two sons with only a small allotment to be shared among his seven daughters. (laughs) However, even this was denied to the girls by their mother's new husband. Sarah was left with no dowry and no prospects beyond her marriage to an indentured servant named Daniel Poole, who left her heavily in debt when he died soon after they tied the knot. The small portion of land that Sarah had received from her father's estate was lost in a suit filed by Poole's creditors. She and her new husband sold the remainder, leaving them both impoverished and homeless. They were forced to beg for food and money from house to house in Salem. It was rumored that she walked off muttering something after Reverend Samuel Paris gave her charity. Remember, he's the father of Elizabeth Paris, who is one of the little girls suffering from fits. Thank you. Sarah developed a bit of a reputation for being unpleasant, whether she received charity or not. (laughs) When one couple gave her lodgings for a time, they said she was so turbulent a spirit, spiteful and so maliciously bent that they put her out. Her husband told the examiners that she was an enemy to all good. Oh, That was nice of him. Yeah. When accused of never attending church, she said it was because she hadn't any proper attire for the services. Good was accused of witchcraft on March 6, 1962, when Abigail Williams and Elizabeth Paris claimed to be bewitched under her hand. The young girls asserted that they had been bitten, pinched, and otherwise abused. When Reverend Samuel Paris asked, Who torments you? The girls eventually shouted out the names of three townspeople, Tatuba, Sarah Osborne, and Sarah Good. Mindy, why don't you tell us a little bit about Sarah Osborne? Do you want to know about 500 pounds? Oh, yes. So (laughs) if, uh, if this website is correct in... 2017, it would be worth about 60,000 pounds, which if you do the math to US dollars, it is about $82,500. That's a lot of money. Um, It could buy you back then 92 horses, 120 (laughs) cows. I'm not going to keep on going. Um, Wow. I have a feeling I know why she was muttering and pissed all the time. (laughs) 
Just saying, just saying. Okay, so let's let's hear about Sarah Osborne. Sarah Osborne was born in Watertown, Massachusetts in the early 1600s. She married a prominent man by the name of Robert Prince. Prince was the brother-in-law and neighbor of C- Captain John Putnam, a member of the notable Putnam family. She and her husband moved to Salem Village in 1662, where the couple had two sons and a daughter. Shortly following Robert Prince's death, Sarah hired an Irish indentured immigrant, Alexander Osborne. Eventually, Alexander Osborne paid off his indenture and the two married. I bet he paid off his indenture. (laughs) Despite the late prince's wishes to carry over his 150-acre farm to his two sons, Sarah upset social norms when she overtook the property for herself and her new husband because prince's will designated that the land would go to his sons once they came of age. Sarah's taking of this property entered her into legal issues with her children. Sarah was also considered a social outcast, albeit for different reasons than Sarah Good. Osborne had not attended church in almost three years due to a long illness. Also, many in Salem knew about her fornication with Alexander, and by endeavoring to gain full ownership of her late husband's estate, she ignored the tradition of family alliances in Salem, and as she was denying her two sons wealth and social position. How dare she? The Putnam's economic stability grew less secure by Sarah's attempt at economic independence. Therefore, the accusations against Osborne were likely the product of powerful suggestions from the Putnam family. The warrant for Sarah Osborne's arrest was written for March 1st, 1692. All right. Now let's talk about the third person who was accused from these two little girls. Historians know little about Tatuba's background, and what they do know is muddied by folklore, popular literature, and biased historical records that center racist stereotypes. Tatuba was enslaved and owned by Reverend Samuel Paris. Although her origins are debated, historian Elaine G. Breslau has gone to great lengths to uncover details about Tatuba's early life and has traced her to an Arawak-speaking group in the northeast coast of South America, now present-day Venezuela. Due to the demand for indigenous household slaves to relieve the labor crisis in Barbados at the time, Breslau suggested that it's likely that Tatuba and her husband were captured on a kidnapping expedition and taken into service before they were purchased by Reverend Samuel Paris and brought to Massachusetts in 1680. Little is known regarding Tatuba's life prior to her enslavement. Truthfully, her story may never be clearly sorted out because her status as a slave constrains any attempts to uncover official records and papers relating to her. The little glimpse of her life that is available is provided only by the court transcripts themselves. Tituba was the first person to be accused by Elizabeth Paris and Abigail Williams of witchcraft. Breslau writes, Settled in the white Puritan society of Salem Village, Tituba's multicultural upbringing alone would have raised suspicions, but the most visible and immediate mark of demonic associations was the color of her skin. It has been theorized that Tituba told the girls tales of voodoo and witchcraft prior to the accusations. As I stated, Tituba was the first to be accused of witchcraft, and she was also the first to confess to it, and she began accusing others of using black magic as well. During the trials before a hushed courtroom, Tituba wove a rich tale confirming the authorities' fears that satanic evil was afoot in Salem. Villagers sat captivated as she outlined an array of demonic characters, animal accomplices, and evil spirits intent on destroying the Puritan way of life according to English folk beliefs. Tales of black dogs, red cats, yellow birds, pink hearts, orange stars, <laughs> yellow moons, and green clovers. They're magically delicious. Sorry, I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't resist. Uh, and also a tall, white-haired man who had traveled from Boston and ordered her to sign the devil's book. She confessed to pinching girls. What is up with all this pinching? 
Hey, no, man. no, I, I wasn't aware of that witches like to pinch people. She confessed to pinching girls in several households and riding through the night on sticks with Good and Osborne, and even described the existence of a malevolent coven of witches in Boston. With every revelation, officials gained the evidence of satanic influence they needed to begin to convict the villagers of witchcraft. Oh my god, she was probably like, white people are so stupid. She was totally fucking with them, right? She like- was totally fucking with them <laughs> because, I mean, we'll we'll get into, um, I don't want to go too much more into okay. her story right now. We do come back to her, but she was quite brilliant and yeah. you will see why in a little bit so put a pin in that but yes <laughs> that's, that's pretty fucking ballsy she like, knew for how to time. manipulate these puritans for yeah. sure so by the end of may more than 60 people were in custody the vast majority were women but a handful of men were also detained arrests were made in numerous towns beyond salem and salem village which today we know as danvers warrants were issued by the dozen sometimes for the arrest of the most unlikely suspects. Among those detained were Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse, upstanding members of the local churches in Salem Village and Salem Town, respectively. Corey, a very godly woman, and a woman who, in her own words, had made a profession of Christ and rejoiced to go hear the word of God had drawn the attention of the prosecutors just by offering the opinion that the accusers were just, quote, poor, distracted children, end quote. Wow. So even religion couldn't save you if you went against the the accusers and just, you know, tried to throw a rational explanation yep. <laughs> at them other than, uh, you know, witchcraft. Nope. You're accused yeah. of a witch, too. Yep, pretty much. Ultimately, between 150 and 200 people were charged with practicing witchcraft. The grand juries and trials for the charges of witchcraft were conducted by a court of Oyer and Terminer, which literally means to hear and to determine. On June 2nd, the specially convened court sat for the first time and was presided over by William Stoughton, the newly appointed lieutenant governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay. As chief justice, Stoughton believed that spectral evidence presented to the court, that is, evidence gathered from dreams and visions, would be the main source of evidence for the prosecutions. I'll say that again. Dreams and visions would be the main evidence used in court to determine if someone was guilty of practicing witchcraft A crime punishable by death. What? The duck test was like too scientific (laughs) for the prosecution? What the fuck? Anyway, if there's any Monty Python fans listening, that's for you. Me. Yay. (laughs) What's more, uh, the accused would be denied any legal representation, which should be shocking. But given everything we've covered so far, that tracks. And you thought. Our current judicial system was fucked up, though really, to be fair, the bar is set pretty damn low. So in the first the first case brought before the grand jury was that of Bridget Bishop, a woman around the age of 60 who faced a plethora of accusations that she could pass through doors and windows without opening them. That she made holes in the road suddenly open up, which carts would fall into before the holes would instantly disappear, swallowing them back up. And that she had summoned a black pig with the body of a monkey and the feet of a cockerel, which is a young rooster. Cool. I want to see that animal. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. Um, A large proportion of the case against Bishop was also focused on her lifestyle especially her rumored promiscuity and unpuritan ways. I would be the worst Puritan ever, I swear. We both would. Tried and found guilty within the course of a single day. Bishop was hanged a week later on June 10th. This was the first execution of the trials. After Bishop's execution, the court endorsed the indictments against Rebecca Nurse and John Willard. 
Willard was serving as a constable in the village of Salem, and his duties included bringing the accused before the court. Soon, however, he began to doubt the truth of the accusations, and he refused to make any more arrests, which good for him, sort of. Well, (laughs) not not good for him. (laughs) In retaliation, Ann Putnam and others accused him of witchcraft and of murdering 13 citizens. Okay, so like, were there 13 people murdered or did they just like totally make that up just to make it seem like, uh, oh yeah, and he uh, murdered 13 people. Like, you know, just for good measure, he he definitely deserves to be executed. Yeah, it kind of sounds like there's a lot of that going on, though. Like, that, it just seems you know. like that just came out of nowhere. Fake news, maybe? Fa- <laughs> uh-huh. Don't uh-huh. say that. I hate that term. But I'm just saying. Um, anyway, in early July, Sarah Good, Elizabeth Howe, Susanna Martin, Rebecca Nurse, and Sarah Wilds were the next five people tried and found guilty of witchcraft, and they made their journey to the gallows a few days later. The indictments then came on fast and furious, with another five people executed exactly one month later on August 19th. Four of them were men, actually. In mid-September, another group went to the gallows, who Reverend Noyes referred to as the eight firebrands of hell. Uh, The only person actually not to die from hanging was Giles Corey, the husband of Martha Corey, who refused to enter a plea, and so he was subjected to a particularly gruesome form of torture and was pressed to death. This is when uh, the accused is crushed under heavy stones until they either respond or die. Lovely. Sounds horrific. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to Tatuba. Yeah. Mm. What's up with that? What happened to her? She likely realized that it would be generally less risky <laughs> to own up to a supernatural conspiracy than flatly deny involvement. Why? Puritans hate liars, but they can't deny a good request for forgiveness. I have that on a t-shirt. <laughs> we should make t-shirts that say that <laughs> um the 20th previous deaths were proof of that so instead Tatuba, knowing her identity already made her a guilty suspect gave the superstitious pilgrims a masterfully believable confession that was perfectly tailored to fit with their puritan beliefs i so, knew it i knew it She's brilliant. I mean, she knew how to manipulate them to save her life. In her testimony, Tatuba said that women have a predisposition towards sin and that as a slave, she had an obligation towards servitude. When she admitted satanic involvement, she called upon scripture by referencing the severe threat of the devil and how she had endeavored to resist his evil. Most importantly, Tatuba drew upon the Puritan belief that if you confessed and repented, you could be saved. With a heartfelt apology, she vowed that she never meant to hurt poor Elizabeth Paris <laughs> and proclaimed her love for the child. The verdict was in. Tatuba had composed the perfect Puritan confession. Because she had repented, the Puritans could not justify killing her. Well played. Little is known of what happened to Tituba after the trial. Despite her confession, a grand jury declined to indict her due to a lack of evidence, though she did languish in a crowded Boston prison for 15 months because Reverend Samuel Paris refused to pay her bail. Mm. In April 1693, she was sold to an unknown person for the price of the debts, and after which she disappeared from historical record. As an enslaved and tainted woman of color, however, it's unlikely that she would have been permitted to re-enter society. Unlike other accused white witches who, upon confession, could be regenerated and reintegrated into the community, Tatuba wore the dark skin of reprobation. As 1692 passed into 1693, the mass hysteria and witch hunt began to lose steam. Increase matter... That's his first name, Increase. Thank you for, yeah, thank you. (laughs) 
Um, yeah, I had to look that one up a couple times. I've never heard that name before. No, I think we I, need to bring that name back. I think we do not. That's so bizarre. Wow. Anyway. Increase Mather, an influential minister and the president of Harvard, condemned the use of spectral evidence <laughs> and instead favored direct accusations uh governor phipps of the colony upon hearing that his own wife was accused of witchcraft ordered a halt to the proceedings of the court of oyer and terminer how convenient right yeah nice in their place he established a superior court of judicature which was instructed not to admit (laughs) dreams and visions into evidence uh, Your Honor, I would like to submit into evidence the dream I had last night where I was naked riding right. a unicorn. Objection. Sustained. So <laughs> being a, uh, a big Twin Peaks fan, for those of you who weren't aware by our previous 107 episodes where I talk about Twin Peaks, um, Special Agent Dale Cooper would have loved a court that allowed spectral evidence. Dude. Seriously. <laughs> Your Honor, I would like to call Special Agent Dale Cooper to the stand as a witness for the prosecution. Okay, what evidence do you have? Well, Your Honor, I had a dream last night that I was in a red room with a small, dancing, backwards-talking man, and the dead girl, Laura Palmer, was there as well, and she told me who killed her. Well, that's good enough for me. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Trials resumed in January and February, but out of the 56 people indicted, only three were convicted. And they, along with everyone else held in custody, had all been pardoned by Governor Phipps by May of 1693 as the trials came to an end. (laughs) Then Salem became super progressive. (laughs) Women, black people, indigenous people, and other people of color were all given equal rights to white (laughs) Christian men. And the first Pride Parade was held (laughs) in the first ever Pride Month the following June, 1693, the and woo, da 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 da. <laughs> and everybody lived happily ever after. Just kidding. Um, but all in all, twenty people and two dogs were executed for the crime of witchcraft in Salem. What the fuck did dogs do to hurt anybody? What the hell? I don't know. And how, like, how would you accuse a dog of witchcraft? Like, what would a dog do that would be considered <clears throat> witchcraft? Bark. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't get it. Um, oh my god! All right, so Mindy, why don't you tell us a little bit about what caused the outbreak of hysteria in Salem that led to all the trials in the first place? Well, in the over three hundred years since the Salem witch trials began, experts have gone to great lengths to offer explanations for the young Salem girls' fits trying to come up with a much more rational explanation than witchcraft. Imagine that. A 1976 study printed in the journal Science attributed the girl's hysterical and possibly hallucinogenic behavior to the ingestion of rye bread made with grain infected with ergot of rye, a.k.a. the girls might have been tripping balls. (laughs) <laughs> um, ergot contains lysergic acid, a precursor for the synthesis of LSD. Certainly, the visions of shape-shifting devils reported by the afflicted might be consistent with the experiences of an acid trip, huh? Other medical explanations have included encephalitis lethargica, a disease carried by birds and animals, and Lyme disease, an infection that it produces skin rashes similar to those believed to have been administered by the Salem witches. Other diagnoses have focused more on the mental well-being of the Salem girls. Psychosomatic disorders have been suggested as the root of of the hysteria, most notably the societal strains placed on them in a strict, deeply religious adult world that made no contingency for the developmental needs of children. The hysterical behavior was an unconscious outlet for rebellion, a release valve for the pressure that the threat of eternal damnation 
put them under. So yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, this option here. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, could you imagine? They were the perfect age. They're gearing up for puberty. Hormones alone can be a mind fuck at like any age. But if you've had this belief system ingrained in you since birth, you've probably been actively suppressing like natural urges from an early age, like, you know, running around outside as a toddler or even like kissing a boy at age 11. Yeah, I think if you're that, yeah, that's going to leave some major inner conflicts happening, both mentally and physically, really. And that's going to need an outlet. And dude, your body don't care. No matter the, your religious beliefs, the body will find a way to right itself with or without you. Well, it's funny that the uh, one person who suggested that got hung. <laughs> so, right? you know. Yeah, right. Good point. Thank you for adding that, Sharon. But uh, yikes. Yeah. And I mean, I was a pretty big asshole when I was growing up, mm -hmm. but my shenanigans never resulted in the death of 20 people and two dogs. That is some teen angst. Is it weird that I'm still really upset about the two dogs? <laughs> no. I looked it up, actually. Yes. <gasps> how do, how do dogs commit uh, witchcraft? Uh, well, so it was believed at the time that witches had animal familiars mm -hmm. or helpers that, used, uh, that they used to do their bed bidding. Um, oh, and so, uh, many villagers were often on the lookout for these possessed animals, which were thought to take on the form of other creatures. Um, and, uh, oh God, this was a ridiculous. In October of 1692, an afflicted girl in Andover accused a neighbor's dog of trying to bewitch her. The villagers shot the dog immediately, <gasps> only after its death. And did the minister Cotton Mather declare that the animal was innocent because they believed that if it were... Uh, possessed or a devil in disguise, it could not uh, die, but it did die. <laughs> but, so then what was the point of shooting it? Right. It was innocent. Thank God. Aww. Well. Oh, yeah. Thank God. Now it's dead. Right. Poor dog. <laughs> wow. Well, and like the whole devil dog mythology, too. I had thought of, I had forgotten about that. Oh, poor babies. And those other people. <laughs> and the other 20 people. Sorry. I didn't mean it sounds so callous, but it's all <laughs> fucked up. Finally, there's the theory that it w this was all just good old fashioned spite. It, in an insular society like Salem, where anyone straying from the norm was immediately criticized or condemned, accusations of witchcraft were a method of self defense, of keeping the more undesirable elements of the local community at arm's length, if not removing them completely. Uh, so, are there still witches around, Sharon, these days? There are lots of witches around these days. Witches, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about modern day witches. In the U.S., mainstream interest in witches has occasionally waned, but mostly waxed, usually in tandem with the rise of feminism or the lack of trust in the establishment's ideas. In the 19th century, as transcendentalism and the women's suffrage movement took hold, witches enjoyed the beginnings of a rebranding. They went from being wicked devil worshippers to more intuitive wise women. Woodstock and second wave feminism were also a big boon for witches. Their popularity spiked again following the Anita Hill hearings in the 1990s. Yeah, I don't know if this had anything to do with that, but The Craft, Practical Magic, The Crucible, Hocus Pocus, all those movies about witches were all released in the 90s, FYI. Hmm, I hadn't thought about that. And then there was another spike after Donald Trump's election, also alongside the Me Too movement. Really? There was, and we will get a little bit more into that. Um, put, so put a pin in that. The latest witch renaissance coincides with a growing fascination with astrology, crystals, and tarot, which, like magic, practitioners consider ways to tap into the unseen. These unconventional sources of powers can be especially appealing for people who feel disenfranchised or who have been growing weary of trying to enact change by working within the system. Just a side note, modern witchcraft has drawn more women than men, as well as many people of color and queer or transgender individuals, and a, quote, witch, unquote, can be any gender. So which does not mean woman. I just wanted to clarify that. Right. 
The more frustrated people get, they often turn to witchcraft because they're like, well, Mm -hmm. the usual channels just aren't working. So let's see what else is out there. Whenever there are events that can really shake the foundation of society, people absolutely turn towards the occult. There is currently a magic resistance that exists and the people who are part of it share guides with each other. And there are guides to hex corporations. Mm -hmm. There are spells to protect reproductive rights. And there was even a hashtag bind Trump Facebook group that casts spells to curb the president's power. Yeah, that one I knew about. I thought that was kind of awesome, actually. (laughs) I had no idea because I got off Facebook right before 2016 and or not right before 2016 at the end of 2016 because I was sick of getting into arguments with strangers (laughs) about Trump (laughs) (laughs) and I haven't been back since and it's been so nice throughout history attempts to control women have masqueraded as crackdowns on witchcraft and for some people simply self-identifying as a witch a witch being a symbol for strong female power is another form of activism, especially because people who do identify as witches sometimes have to face violence and misogyny because of it. Gabriella Herstic, a witch and an author, says, quote, witchcraft is feminism and it's inherently political. It's always been about the outsider, about the woman who doesn't do what the church or patriarchy wants, end quote. So just like the bumper sticker I had in the back window of my car, like when I was in high school that said, sorry, I missed church. I was busy practicing witchcraft and becoming a lesbian. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And then your dad borrowed your car one day and didn't realize that bumper sticker was on there and was getting lots of strange looks. (laughs) Yes. They were not thrilled. I thought it was funny. I think that's hysterical. If I saw your dad, if I just saw like some middle-aged man driving a car with that bumper sticker, I would be like, that's the coolest guy ever. (laughs) Um, Modern day witches of the Western world still struggle to shake their historical stereotype. Most practice Wicca, which started around the 1950s and is an official religion in the United States and Canada. Wiccans avoid evil and the appearance of evil at all cost. Their motto is to harm none, and they strive to live a peaceful, tolerant, and balanced life in tune with nature and humanity. I actually practiced Wicca for a bit in high school and also early college, and it's true. Like, that's one of the things that drew me to it is because, um, well, one, I was vegan, so... You were an outcast. I was already an outcast because I was literally like the only vegan in my high school until one other guy um, came to our high school and then he he also happened to be vegan. They were trying to bus in vegans? (laughs) (laughs) I think he just moved from Chicago, unfortunately, to our small little town. Um, But yeah, I had this connection and love for animals and nature and, you know, I was basically made fun of and called a liberal from like seventh grade onwards and didn't like I wasn't religious and but I was looking for something and I found Wicca and I was like this resonates with me like this speaks to me um so I practice it and it is it's a very uh open peaceful religion and Personally, I worshipped Mother Goddess or Mother Earth, and I followed the rule of three, which is also known as uh, the threefold law or the law of return, which basically states that whatever energy a person puts out into the world, be it positive or negative, that will be returned to that person three times. And it doesn't necessarily have to be threefold, but I still live by this rule like every day, like I try and put as much positive energy out into the world and just refrain from putting out negative energy. And it's literally changed my life. I used to be a pretty vindictive person. Like if you did something to me, I would try to like fuck you over and my life was shit. And as soon as I stopped doing that and let the universe take care of people that hurt like me or my friends or family, Uh, my life became so much better and it's not perfect. It's not perfect at all. But like, even when things are really, really bad, they're like, 
the best possible bad if that makes any sense but i i think everyone should live their lives like this because uh I, I really do think energy attracts and, you know, it, it just should be about being kind to people. Uh, kind of like how you should be kinder to me when we do trivia. <clears throat> All right, bitch, shut up. <laughs> I'm kind. There's a difference between competitive and kind. <laughs> <laughs> I think my point was made. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> no, I, I'm just giving you shit. Sorry. I just remember our friend Joe, who was actually on our show before... <laughs> He would always in high school just say to you, so today are you a good witch or a bad witch? Oh, yeah. Him and all his his friends, they went to a separate but high school. But it wasn't good. It wasn't good fun, though. He wasn't it was. like being a But every asshole. time they would see me, are you a good witch or a bad witch? I'll be like, I'll try me, motherfucker. Cast a spell on you and you'll see. No. Yeah, I, that's the thing. I would never do that. <laughs> I would never cast a spell on someone. What's funny, though, is that the, the that rule of three is prevalent like in all religions. Uh, yeah in some form or another i i think i mean yeah. i don't i don't know a ton about other religions because i'm not religious but yes i've in in certain like christianity for sure with the trinity um and they i'm even, not sure about like with satanic stuff like a lot of occultists or like people who study the occult or whatever believe that like if you hear like a like three knocks like when you like people whose houses are ha- are haunted or whatever or think they're haunted oftentimes they'll hear knocks in groups of threes and that is supposed to mean like a mockery of goodness and of god and all that stuff i don't know that's what they say well but, the witch an hour is at 3 a.m which that, yeah oh, yes, it also very right. is, yes it's a very mockery of the trinity supposedly crazy. The threes man okay i'm gonna stop saying that now <laughs> man <laughs> So I guess like my great aunt probably would have been considered a witch. Um, from what I've heard, she was a bit stubborn and opinionated. Uh, so definitely my grandfather's sister. Uh, but I, I can't picture her being shy about any visions she might have had. And we know that she actually did know things that she couldn't possibly have naturally known. So I just, again, I would absolutely have been convicted of witchcraft. I'd suck at being a Puritan in general, really. But honestly, I doubt I would have even lived this long in 1692. My allergies alone would have like done me in at an early age. <laughs> well, these days, a modern modern day witches still perform witchcraft, but there's seldom anything sinister about it. A modern day witchcraft potion is more likely to be an herbal remedy for the flu instead of like a hex to harm someone. Uh, Juliet Diaz and author of the best-selling book Witchery, Embrace the Witch Within, describes herself as a seer capable of reading auras and connecting with the other side. She's a plant whisperer who can communicate with her succulents. I've never heard of that before. And she's one... She needs to talk to my succulents because... (laughs) You need to talk to your succulents. I do. And they still... It's... Oh, I cannot keep plants alive. She's also one in a long line of healers in her family, which traces its roots to Cuba and the indigenous Taino people who settled in parts of the Caribbean. She's also a professional witch. Diaz sells anointing oils and intention-infused body products in her online store, instructs more than 8,900 witches enrolled in her online school, Uh, and leads witchery workshops. Diaz remembers when she was growing up, her family's spell work felt taboo, I bet. (laughs) But over the past few years, witchcraft, long viewed with suspicion and even hostility, has transmuted into a mainstream phenomenon. I want to get her book. I think that's uh, pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I love that she was able to um, use her, her heritage to basically make a career out of being a witch to use like the traditions and 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 cultures of you know of her family to do this i think that's pretty awesome yeah yeah there's a store actually right around the corner from my house that's like that i i just found out um but yeah you said branding spencer and i cringe a little bit which put a pin in that (laughs) because Diaz says, quote, a lot of girls, young girls, they post pictures of their house 
with their room with upside down crosses. They wear goth clothes with their potions. They don't even practice witchcraft. And they're like, oh, I'm a witch. <laughs> It, it takes away well, from the wait, sacred. Wait, wait, wait. Did Mindy go somewhere and a teenage girl took over? Uh-huh. She's right, though. It takes away from the sacredness of the word. And that was the end of her quote. She's also troubled by what she sees as the commodification of witchcraft and the cultural appropriation that's become of it, such as white witches borrowing from indigenous or African diasporic traditions. Paulo Santo a wood that is traditionally burned by shamans is now a staple of yoga studio studios everywhere. And you can purchase yours from Urban Outfitters, Bloomingdale's, Anthropology, and even through Goop, but probably for three times the price. <laughs> In her own store, Diaz aims to source from indigenous people and sell only products she develops herself. That's awesome. Unfortunately, witches, whether real or accused, still face persecution and death. Several men and women suspected of using witchcraft have been beaten and killed in Papua New Guinea since uh, 2010, including a young mother who was burned alive. Similar episodes of violence against people accused of being witches have occurred in Africa, South America, the Middle East, and in immigrant communities in Europe and the United States. So... Sharon, what about Salem? Has it changed since the trials? It has changed a lot since the trials. Um, so this section all comes from the previously mentioned article in Vox written by Tara Isabella Burton. According to Smithsonian's Danny Lewis, the witch trials were historically a taboo subject within Salem uh, for good reason. A reminder of a horrific transgression that, that took place there. But in the 20th century, interest in the Salem witch trials is a pop culture phenomenon was renewed. This seems to have started with Arthur Miller's 1953 play, The Crucible. Then came the popular TV show, Bewitched, that started in 1964. The sitcom even filmed a portion of its seventh season in Salem in 1970. In this season, the main character, Samantha, magically time travels back to 17th century Salem and uses her powers to prove that the other accused witches were innocent, condemning the prejudices of those who thought otherwise. I had no idea that this TV show ever went in that direction. I used no. to watch this as a kid, but like, I don't think I ever saw season seven and then they saw samantha and they said a witch and she got killed i was that's kind of funny Spencer. <laughs> bewitched inadvertently changed the way people saw salem salem became witch city and witches were now in fashion and salem's witch history could be monetized not to mention salem really needed the money after centuries of being a prosperous shipping port salem fortunes were in decline the witch tourism boom revitalized Salem. In 2005, in commemoration of that boom, Salem erected a controversial statue of Samantha in the town's main square, raising more debates about the degree to which pro-witch aesthetics had co-opted Salem's legacy. Hmm. Nothing like commercializing the sins of the past to make a buck, am I right? <laughs> does I that mean, statue still stand? Do you know, Yes, Sharon? it does. Really? God, yeah. th this whole thing makes me feel just icky in general. But I also wanted to really quickly, I couldn't help it. I'm sorry, which city? That city. Which city? <laughs> sorry. Who's on first? I couldn't help it every time you said that. I wanted to be like, which tourism? <laughs> that tourism? Um, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. By the 70s, <laughs> feminist and new age movements alike had reappropriated elements of the Salem narrative. For many, the so-called witches of Salem were victims of male conspiracy, and Salem was the story of Earth-centered, natural female spirituality dominated by a group of misogynist men who sought to control them. Witchcraft became something to celebrate. In 1970, witch Lori Cabot opened Salem's first New Age shop, and several others followed suit. The Salem Witch Museum opened in 1972. The museum is dedicated to the history of the witch from the pre-Christian era to the modern day and tells a very clear-cut, if simplistic, narrative. 
Women, particularly midwives, were once in touch with the earth. They worshipped a pre-Christian goddess. Once Christianity came to power, evil Christian men, basically the church, were afraid of female power and tried to stamp it out. And no emails, please, about us (laughs) talking shit about men in Christianity. This is all from the article. These are not my own words, although I do have my own opinions on this, um, which are not far out. But whatever. If you don't like our opinions, don't listen to our show. Damn. But if you do like our opinions, <laughs> then keep listening <laughs> and tell more. But yeah, I, you know, I, I would say we get uh, more criticism about our political beliefs than we do about the show in general, which there's a million other podcasts out there. If you don't like the show, if you don't like our political beliefs, don't listen. It's that simple. We're still in a free country and we're allowed to say what we want to say. Don't burn me at the stake, people. All right. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Of sales. Overruled. (laughs) Shut up. I thought it was funny. All right. Of Salem's 40,000 residents, between 800 and 1,600 identify as witches, with many working in or through the town's witch shops or in witch-related tourism industries, such as the city's magic-themed walking tours. Whoa. For the people of Salem... And honestly, for anyone who is interested in the subject, there are multiple camps of beliefs regarding why the Salem witch trials took place to begin with. For some, the accusers and magistrates of Salem were motivated by a combination of fear and greed, including a desire to seize the lands of the accused. For others, it's about misogyny and men policing women's identities. But likely it was the result of a multitude of different factors, because Nothing is black and white. Right. There's huge gray areas, uh, you know, in the middle of all this. Little column A, little column B, a little mm-hmm. bit of column C. Yeah, absolutely. Christina Stevick, artistic director of the Cry Innocent Project, which lets people experience a mock witch trial, says, quote, The dangers of foreign invasion, tensions within the community over religious observance, The adversarial relationship between the insular Salem village and the wealthier Salem town, tensions over the use of folk magic and various waves of outbreak of illness all contributed to an incident that was about so much more than mere superstition or mere misogyny or mere anything. Mm. She goes on to say, ultimately, developing a more complex understanding of history is necessary if one is to avoid repeating it. End mm. quote. And I could not agree more. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, all of this has happened before, but it doesn't have to happen again. So let's end our discussion with one more quote from the Vox article, which is a really, really great read. And we will have a link to it in our show notes if you want to read the entire article. Quote, ultimately, Salem's history might be less important than its symbolism. The true history of Salem, in other words, might be almost irrelevant. A combination of economics and mythology have made Salem a location of pilgrimage for those who identify with the accused of 1693, whether they are witches themselves, feminists drawn to the narrative of wrongly accused women, or just ordinary people drawn to the story of those penalized for being a little bit different. At Salem's Witch Museum, the narrator tells us, with more than a little derision, that the Puritans were a superstitious people. What? They made up stories to explain the world around them, narratives that would make the chaos of their existence make sense. Mm. But if Salem can teach us anything, not a lot has changed. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. So, (laughs) yeah, I had had to end the discussion with that because... Yeah, no, good. It's a good point. This is like is something I could see still taking place today. And well, as you know, Mindy said, you know, in parts of the world, it does. Even in Europe and the U.S., there's yeah. still modern day witch hunts. So, um, yeah, let's uh, remember that, everyone. Let's, um, you know, try and be kinder and uh, and fact check. <laughs> Learn from mistakes and not let's not keep remaking them. And like, that too. If you can't get enough of witches, we wanted to include a wit, a witch. 
a witch. <laughs> if you can't get enough of drink witch, every time we say witch in this episode. Seriously. Go back to the beginning. You won't make it past probably the intro. <laughs> <laughs> If you want, if you can't get enough of witches, we wanted to include a list of some of the best movies about the Salem witch trials and also about witches in general. Uh, we put the list in our show notes as well as on our Patreon page. Some of these are going to be super obvious. Um, others are more obscure. Let's start with an obvious one. The Witch from 2015, or some people like to say The Witch because that's how it looks. A story about a cursed family in New England during the 1630s shunned by villagers and who must battle an evil witch in the forest all by themselves. That's I love that movie personally. I know it's mixed reviews out there, but I need to give it another watch. I was not a huge fan the first time I saw it, but yeah, I had to watch it twice. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to watch it again one day. Um, Hocus Pocus, which Spencer and I revisited last night from 1993 and a sequel has been announced as i'm sure everyone knows by now uh taking place in salem massachusetts a young group of school kids accidentally awakens three 17th century witches the infamous sanderson sisters played by bet midler sarah jessica parker and kathy and jimmy is it horrible of me to confess that i'm not really very familiar with this movie nor am I a huge fan not that I'm saying it's bad I know lots of people love it I, it's just not I'm, I'm kind of indifferent is that bad so you have seen it like once a long time ago and I'm not I really don't remember a lot of it I just remember like not being like I mean eh. it's well, it's a maybe, kids movie yeah it's a kids movie but also maybe you should rewatch it because everybody like loves this movie and I don't even really have like the desire to rewatch it, and I feel like that makes me makes me a bad person because everyone's like, "It's so good." So okay, maybe I'll read Well, I it. mean, some people might want to take you to the gallows for that statement. Oh but, come uh, on, <laughs> Mindy, I ag- I agree with you, but I also know that it's a kids movie, so I just sort of let it go. Gotcha. Okay. Well, this is not a kids movie, despite the title. Um, our next <laughs> movie is Ro- Rosemary's Baby from 1968. <laughs> Uh, I wonder the, how many people have gotten confused about if that's a kid's movie or not. I mean, you never know. Based on a 1967 novel of the same name by uh, Ira Levin, a young couple trying for a baby moves into a fancy apartment surrounded by peculiar neighbors. Rosemary becomes pregnant and begins to fear that a satanic coven in the building has sinister plans for her baby. Mindy, are the movie kids and little children are those kids movies <laughs> uh maybe you should show them to your kids and find out i've no i've seen both of them absolutely not kids movies. i don't think anyone <laughs> would think that I, th- <laughs> I just think it's funny that like any any movie that has like kids or baby or children or something in the title like oh it's a kids movie when there's like so many movies out there that have that in the title that are clearly not appropriate for kids at all. It was called a uh, joking transition. That's what I was I, trying to do. I know. And I, I just appreciated thought it, it. It was funny. Thank you, Spencer. And decided to carry on the joke. <laughs> all right. Next, we have Eve's Bayou from 1997. It is a Southern Gothic drama that takes place in Louisiana and adds a witchy spin to a family rift between a daughter and her unfaithful father. The way the daughter aims to handle the issue... Through voodoo witchcraft, the occult, mysticism, and a surreal dive into psychological evolution. Fabulous movie, if you've never seen it. So well done. Voodoo ain't no joke, too. Like, you don't mess with that shit. I'm actually scared to rewatch this movie. (laughs) Okay, well, I mean, I gotta say, if you're gonna talk witches, you gotta talk about the craft, and that's because of my age, probably. (laughs) Um, That's from 1996. I just remember that was a big deal for a while when we were growing up. Well, no, we were adults. We were not adults. Well, we were were like 
I'm gonna this do this was, over. It came Forget. out when we were in high school. Well, yeah, ninety six. So we had just graduated. We're still not adults. What are you talking about? Yeah, very good point. <laughs> so Sarah is the new girl at a Catholic prep school. She has the psychic ability to move pencils with her mind. She befriends three other girls who eventually adopt her as a member of their coven. And in a witch's version of Heather's, they get revenge against all the mean kids at school. Uh, fun fact, Robin Tunney, who plays Sarah in The Craft, is a Chicago native. Woo! Hmm, I didn't know that. Um, next, we have Practical Magic from 1998. Two witch sisters, played by Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock, raised by their eccentric aunts, uh, played by the amazing Diane Weist and uh, Stockard Channing. Uh, they're in a small town, they face closed-minded prejudice and a curse which threatens to prevent them from finding lasting love. Um, I like this movie way, way, way more than I probably should, but really? I really I, love this movie. Really? And it has Aiden Quinn, who's uh, adorable, and I love him so much. So, yeah, huh. it's, a, it's a great movie if you've not seen it. It's not scary or anything no. like that, but it's it's... <laughs> has such an amazing cast and it's so much fun and the um the town and the setting that it takes place in it takes place on Whidbey Island in um in Washington it's just absolutely beautiful there huh okay I've never seen it I don't think well maybe you should watch it so next up we have the three mothers series by Dario Argento um you've probably heard us talk about them it's a point these movies if you listen to our show uh starting the first in the series well, at least Suspiria I don't yeah. think we've ever talked about the others Suspiria is the first of the trilogy from 1977 um an American newcomer to a prestigious German ballet academy comes to realize that the school is a front for something sinister amid a series of very grisly murders and then in 1980 came Inferno an American college student in Rome and his sister in New York investigate a series of killings in both locations where their resident addresses are the domain of two covens of witches. And I think A Mother in Tears is the only one I have not seen personally. That was from 2007. Uh, an American art student in Rome accidentally triggers the return of, and help me out, Sharon, it's, it's, Mater Ma Lacrimarum. There we go. Thank you. Uh, the last surviving member of the three sis the three mothers, um, and must use her newfound magic powers to end the witch's campaign of violence and death. Um, All right. I'm these go without saying that you should see these. No. Okay. I'm going to totally disagree with you right now. <laughs> really? You should see Suspiria because Suspiria is amazing i've seen um, inferno it's go it's okay uh so i watched inferno for the first time last night and this movie go fuck itself uh for any animal lovers out there or for anyone who hates uh violence against animals in movies there is a pretty drawn out cat scene that was hard to watch and then following that was another cat scene that was even harder to watch that was even longer followed by a scene with hundreds and hundreds of rats which was also very hard to watch and i basically had to stop watching the movie at that point and was like could not wait for it to end but yeah it had like none of the it was still the the lighting and the um set design were very beautiful yeah uh but not nearly as beautiful as suspiria the music in suspiria from goblin is basically it sets the whole mood of that movie and it just creates this really spooky atmosphere throughout the entire thing and inferno lacked that i mean there is music but it was it was not as good as the music from goblin in the first one and yeah i just did not like this movie at all it just i didn't care about any of the characters it didn't really make tons of sense it just felt like disjointed. I don't yeah. know. I would skip that one. And Mother of Tears is supposed to be even worse. Oh, but, really? Um, Ooh. Yeah, it's supposed to be the um, least uh, good of the three movies. And I, I added these movies to the document before I watched Inferno last night. <laughs> so Suspiria good. Inferno, I'm going to say pass. I mean, if you want to check it out, 
that's up to you. I've given you your warnings. <laughs> and Mother of Tears, I'm I'm not watching at all after Inferno. Like there's I, no way. Yeah, I now I have okay. And then I don't really care either. That's wow. I he so he like just peaked and then that was it. <laughs> I mean, he has a lot of other good movies. I that's really true, like Dario Argento. Like yeah. It, I've this honestly Inferno is the only movie by him that I was like fuck this movie so (laughs) cool thank you for that trigger warning Sharon yeah all right um we have Black Sunday from 1960 which is a Mario Bava movie about a vengeful witch and her fiendish servant who return from the grave and begin a bloody campaign to possess the body of the witch's beautiful lookalike descendant yeah which is um I love this movie it's beautiful and the uh, use of light and shadows is is amazing, and also the set design is amazing, and it's it's kind of like a almost like a Scooby Doo esque. Yes, it does kind of have that feel. That's very true. I mean, there's like secret passageways in yeah. like the fireplace and yeah, like yeah. behind paintings and stuff like that. It's 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 really cool. It's, it's not scary, but um, no, it's it's great though. Ba- Baba's kind of I think like horror classic. You know, like he's just uh, his movie, The Evil Eye, is such I I could see echoes of like some of his effects in like modern horror even still. So like, yeah, I recommend this movie highly. This is such a good one. Definitely worth the watch. Um, A little bit later in 2016, (laughs) we've got uh, the autopsy of Jane Doe, a father and son, both coroners are pulled into a complex mystery while attempting to identify the body of a young woman who is apparently harboring dark secrets. You're not going to say anything about this one? <laughs> oh, okay. I have nothing to say ever. No. I honestly need to rewatch this movie because I did see it, but I, I, I don't remember a lot of it. I know it, was, I know it wasn't long ago that I saw it, but I want to rewatch it. So, But I remember it being good and... I think I was just tired and fell asleep or something lame like that because that's how I, I roll sometimes these days. But yeah, I, I, I do definitely want to rewatch it. Sharon loves this movie. So I think this is one of the scariest movies that's come out in recent years. And also it has Emile Hirsch and Brian Cox, who I both <laughs> yeah, love. That's true. That's so true. Definitely worth a watch. OK, what what's next? Drum roll, drum roll. Next up, The Blair Witch Project from 1999. Of course, we had to put this one on the list. Uh, This found footage blockbuster about a group of teens who seek to discover the truth behind a local urban legend but never return. Um, Probably an unpopular opinion, but I was Hmm. not a huge fan of this movie. But I did think that the very, very ending, that very last scene was creepy as fuck. But... Yes. Other than that, I've only seen it once, honestly. Oh Maybe my I, god! I need to rewatch it. I I want to do some found footage episodes. So Ugh, I'm not a fan of found footage. So good good luck with that one, Mindy. And then next, uh, we have 1999's version of The Crucible. Uh, a Salem resident attempts to frame her ex-lover's wife for being a witch in the middle of the 1692 witchcraft trials, based on, of course, the play by Arthur Miller. Never seen this movie, have you? Uh, I really didn't want to because I read the play. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but did you? No. I, sorry, no. To answer your question, no, I didn't. I just said no desire because I've read this play and yeah. You didn't and, like the play enough end to of story. watch the movie. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not a pick me up really. And I just don't, I mean, no, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm not a big Arthur Miller fan. I'm making em- enemies all over the place today, but I know everyone loves like Death of a Salesman or whatever. I'm not a fan, a huge fan of his stuff. This and podcast so, is known for Arthur Miller fans. <laughs> I know, but so yeah, so I didn't want to watch the movie because I didn't like the play. So why would I watch a movie of a play I don't like? I don't think you're alone with uh, not liking the play, to be honest. Okay, okay. So, all right, finally. Death of a Salesman can suck it. There you go. She got <laughs> it wow. out. Wow. <laughs> Hot take. <laughs> sorry, sorry. We just lost half our audience. Thanks, Mindy. All right. <laughs> Witches of Salem, which is a four-part TV miniseries from 2019. Uh, This is a documentary 
miniseries that chronologically unravels the rapid descent of a town into madness using reenactments to capture the day-to-day hysteria that unfolds and puts an affluent New England community under siege. Which hysteria? (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) All right. Very Um, well played. (laughs) I have not seen this. um, I was going to ask. It does have good reviews on IMDb. So I'm down for a documentary miniseries. I was going to ask if you had seen it or if you knew where we could find it, but we could look it up. Nope. I just, I found it on a a list of, of movies and TV shows about the Salem witch trials and it had pretty good reviews. So yeah, I might actually check it out if there's uh, somewhere to watch it. Actually, Spencer, why don't you see where that's (laughs) available and we will let our listeners know. And I, uh, while I'm doing that, I also want to mention, um, I don't know if it's Salem specifically, but WandaVision for Marvel yeah. is connected to witches. Yeah, I'm not watching that because Andy told me what it's about and I'm going to cry. So, But I heard it's really good. Uh, the Witches of Salem is on Discovery Plus. Yeah. Oh, I, I've got Discovery Plus. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I will add that to my list of things to watch. Awesome. Because now after doing all this research, I'm like, just completely like enthralled by this whole story and also just how it relates to modern day so well but like in the end I'm kind of we've come to the end of all of this information and this huge story and I'm kind of like and this all started because two girls had <laughs> seizures. Like, that's so crazy. I mean, there's more to it, obviously. Seizures or that, but. acid trips, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's because two kids basically lied. Um, the moral of the story is kids <laughs> don't tell lies. <laughs> that's what this all, that's it's what it all boils down, down to. to. Yeah. Oh, man. Tell the truth. All right. Well, thank you all for listening to us. Please let us know your thoughts on this subject. Uh, What do you think was the cause of the Salem witch trials? And also, do you think that something like this could happen again? Yes. And if you're a real life practicing witch, we would love to hear from you too. Uh, Maybe even have you on the show to talk about what it's like being a witch in the 21st century you know what does that mean to you if you want to dispel any rumors or misconceptions um also if you have any ghost stories that you would like us to read on our show please write to us at whores talk horror at gmail.com and you know write to us with any episode ideas uh recommendations on what to watch uh what are your favorite witch movies if you have any Mm -hmm. true crime stories creepy stories tell us about that one time you were accused of being a witch um whatever you want us to read on our show please write to us we actually just got a suggestion this week from Jamie about a uh, true crime story that takes place in Minnesota. So I'm going to look into that and uh, we might do an upcoming episode on that. So thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah. Please do subscribe to us and rate and review us. It helps us get more exposure and helps us um, you get up there on the charts on iTunes. Uh, If you're able to, please join our Patreon so you can get early access to episodes, see some exclusive posts, and maybe even get some stuff sent to you in the mail that's kind of cool. Please be kind to each other. Be safe out there. Um, No accusing people of witchcraft for any (laughs) reason. Uh, And as always, thanks thanks for for getting getting creepy creepy with us. Sharon, do you want a beer? Uh, Oh, my God.